delegated a task, it's TikTok. You've been delegated a task, it's TikTok. But then you think to yourself, Shannon, can you really do this? We've moved into second person. You decide to go and make a cup of tea while you think about doing all this TikTok stuff you don't want to have to do. You know Gareth feels very sorry for you. How's that? Uh, And then you take a nap on a couch because you're so exhausted. (laughs) Right? (laughs) The power of second person. Mm. That's how I get out of all my chores. Yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pledge of the Text podcast, a shared imagined space where readers and writers make meaning together. We're your hosts, Shannon and Gareth. Good afternoon, Shannon. How are you going? Well, I was still pretending that we were filming in the morning and we'd stuck to schedule, but okay, you've re- revealed me in my, my lie. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm really excited because today we are doing a creative writing segment based on the book review that we did last week, which was Murder in the Dark by Margaret Atwood. And really excited today because we're going to be doing a couple of pieces uh, working with Point of View. Did you want to dive into a bit more about what we're doing today, Gary? Yes. Yes, I do. And I want to start by reading a quote uh, from an Italo Calvino book that I very much love. Uh, because I think it frames what we're going to be talking about in a very clever and witty way. And I feel like in a way we can allow this to shine its reflected glow on us by reading it. It begins, you are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought. Let the world around you fade. Best to close the door. The TV is always on in the next room. The novel begins in a railway station. A locomotive huffs. Steam from a piston covers the opening of the chapter. A cloud of smoke hides part of the first paragraph. I am the man who comes and goes between the bar and the telephone booth. Or rather, that man is called I, and you know nothing else about him, just as this station is only called Station and beyond it there exists nothing except the unanswered signal of a telephone ringing in a dark room of a distant city. Ah, good old Italo. So, yeah, um, what that highlights, I suppose, is this this myth of the first-person narrative where um, we imagine ourselves to know something significant about the narrator because it's in first person but that isn't necessarily true uh and so we're going to be talking about that a little bit today and about second person and you wrote in second person recently didn't you you've been working on a story in second person uh yes i did and uh i remember we were doing a um creative writing group um get together and another member did a second person piece and it's really interesting how using that perspective uh, can create that fatalistic um, sense when you're reading it Um, it's yeah I think point of view is a fantastic uh, tool to have in your craft box being a writer yeah that particular writer Tim um, his piece had I thought in any case uh, an extraordinary sense of narrative momentum and that was driven by the point of view. Mm. Oh, you're so much clearer now. My wife tells me on these podcasts that I need to clean my goddamn glasses because sometimes she can see my fingerprints on the glass. So I just no want everyone way. to know I've done that. Clean as a whistle. That- Ching. She must be watching you really intensely, just your screen, to be she able to see She watches that. our podcast. She's like, that Gareth is awful. No way. Okay. Because I feel like when people that know me watch me, they're like, oh, Shannon, gosh, he's awful. Yeah. I think that's what happens, right? Um, although we have some very generous listeners who have been very, very nice in their comments, and that's been lovely. Um, but yes, enough about us. Enough about yes, the eye. Yes, we dedicate Let's move on to this the podcast eye. to you today, generous listeners, and we will continue <laughs> on to the creative writing segment. So let's get started. What are we working on first? Okay, so we're going to start with first person. 
Um, and I thought perhaps we'd start with an, uh, a passage from Murder in the Dark, specifically the piece Autobiography, which I believe kicks off the entire collection. Yes, it is the first short story or vignette in the first section of this book. So if you feel up to reading that to us, that would be lovely, and uh, we'll all just listen. Yeah. Autobiography. The first thing I can remember is a blue line. This was on the left where the lake disappeared into the sky. At that point, there was a white sand cliff, although you couldn't see it from where I was standing. On the right, the lake narrowed to a river, and there was a dam and a covered bridge, some houses and a white church. In front, there was a small rock island with a few trees on it. Along the shore, there were large boulders and the sawed-off trunks of huge trees coming up through the water. Behind is a house, a path running back into the forest, the entrance to another path which cannot be seen from where I was standing but was there anyway. At one spot this path was wider. Oats fallen from the nose bags of loggers' horses during some distant winter had sprouted and grown. Hawks nested there. Once on the rock island, there was a half-eaten carcass of a deer, which smelt like iron, like rust, rubbed into your hands so that it mixes with sweat. This smell is the point at which the landscape dissolves, ceases to be a landscape, and becomes something else. Right. So I suppose the first question is, what does it become? What do you think? I think throughout that piece, there's a few parts where she disrupts the flow of what you think should be there. So when she's saying to me that it dissolves, the the imaginative space dissolves in a way. Yeah, um, I think that's right. There's a couple of points. She says... In, in the very first paragraph, at that point, there was a white sand cliff, although you couldn't see it from where I was standing. So at, at that moment, the I, the narrative perspective is saying, it's you and me. The I is not just talking to itself. It's not just representing a world from that perspective. There is a you and me. So I am telling you something I can't experience myself. She does this again uh, in the third paragraph. Behind is a house, a path running back into the forest, the entrance to another path which cannot be seen from where I was standing but was there anyway. So what we're getting here is a narrator who's asking us to trust her memory and her inexperience in a sense of these things being there. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's an unusual thing, I think, you know, in a first person narrative, it's called autobiography. Uh, and I think what we're getting here is something else is maybe the point at which a story begins to form. So it's kind of like she's taking inspiration from this landscape. Uh, and then it eventually ceases to be the thing that defines what's being talked about. And then, of course, it could be anything else. So perhaps every piece that follows this vignette is a potential next thing that it dissolves mm. into. Yeah. Um, that's one way of looking at it in any case. But what this highlights is that there's a myth, and you see it reproduced in writing classes, that if you want to really get into character, uh, if the protagonist's character is a central part of your story, if you want the reader to know them like they know themselves, use first person point of view. And that is possibly true, but it doesn't have to be true. First person point of view can be extremely deceptive. It can lead you into all kinds of paths that you wouldn't otherwise take as a reader. It can be yeah. a point of view of lies um, and, and of, of subtext, of the seven-eighths that lies beneath the surface of what is said. So I think this piece um, highlights that in a really delightful way and expresses it, I think, more clearly than I've gone on to explain. 
But this notion that, that first person perspective is somehow more honest or, uh, more of the interior of a character, it's not necessarily true. Um, so I thought what would be interesting is to attempt a first person, uh, point of view narrative. And when I was thinking about first person point of view, I always think of the voiceover. Um, now I, I recall when we were talking about this, you said Morgan Freeman and he is the king of the voiceover. Yeah. Um, but he's often the voiceover. He's like the voice of God. He, he often isn't a character. Like he does a lot of just voiceovers. Um, whereas when I think of voiceover, I always think of Philip Marlowe, the, the 1940s, 50s, hard boiled private investigator sort of thinking to himself as he goes about doing what he's doing. Uh, and in those early films, you would often get those thoughts in voiceover. Uh, you'd get a sort of a Humphrey Bogart or someone of that nature, uh, sort of dead panning over the top of the scenes you were watching. It's quite delightful. Um, and That's what not I thought very I'd do uh, is, popular anymore. No, well, voiceovers come to be seen as a cheap kind of uh, a version of telling essentially rather yeah. than showing what's there. And I think in film that's probably true. Um, however, there is something incredibly delightful about the Chandlerian voiceover and its sort of uh, pithy, somewhat cynical tone. I just yeah. wanted to read you a little bit of – uh, a potential, a possible scene that dissolves into chapter six of uh, Raymond Chandler's unfinished novel, Poodle Springs. If you go and find yourself Poodle Springs, expect to be disappointed. It's by far his weakest book, and it was co-written with Robert B. Parker, who wrote most of it uh, and and did an excellent job, but probably didn't nail it if I'm being completely honest. So this is chapter six, but this is not Robert B. Parker. Um, and I'm going to just leave it mysterious because that sounds like a fun thing to do. So I'll just read you a little bit. On the way back into town, I stopped in at a diner for some breakfast. It was your typical greasy spoon, only in Poodle Springs they probably use a more expensive type of grease. The waitress was a sour-looking woman with a face like a slice of lemon that had been left in the sun for a week. She swept a cloth over the counter in front of me and let me have the last customer's crumbs in my lap. Will it be, mister? Look, sweetness, I said. Don't be so generous. Save the crumbs for a rainy day. All I want is two eggs, three minutes, no more, a slice of your famous concrete toast, a tall glass of tomato juice, a dash of Lee and Perrins, and a big, happy smile, okay? She stared down at me over a notepad like she was going to draw my picture and stick pins in it. You want coffee with that? That depends on if it comes in a cup or if you just pour it over the counter. You're a real wise guy, ain't you, she said, slamming a cup down onto the counter and splashing some coffee into it. Suddenly, I didn't feel like chatting anymore. I could feel that one grand note burning a hole in my pocket, but I didn't think she'd have the change and she sure wasn't worth the tip. So that's the kind of uh that's the kind of thing Raymond Chandler would do. And it's yeah, it's great. It's it's kind of sarcastic and uh abrasive and and really good fun. So I thought we might try and reproduce some of that ourselves. However, okay. I don't think we should use a private eye. I think we should defamiliarize the protagonist and make them something else. It could be anything. It could be a cow standing in a field, thinking about the other cows. It could be uh, a postman uh, having an interaction with a dog. The dog could be uh, transformed into a kind of a 1940s thug. You know, you've got, you've got options. Uh, let your mind roam where it may. Uh, and yeah, you know, we'll spend, what do we normally spend? Five minutes? Uh, let's do six minutes. So we're going to do like a hard boiled, sarcastic character, kind of private eye, bit of a thug, but not the typical character that would be so. 
Right. And, and it's in first person. So what we're saying is I did this. I thought that, um, so you're just maintaining this figure of the I. Okay. And let's see what we come up with. I and mean, that could be quite interesting. Mm, okay. Um, well, let's get started. I'm going to put the timer in, on in three, two, one, and start.
I found that really <laughs> difficult. Yeah, right. It's um, it's definitely got its challenges. I can't um, say that I'm the most pithy or witty person, so trying to be so is uh, quite difficult. It isn't easy, but the great thing about the first person is it gives you a, an excuse because if you make a an observation in third person um, that might be a little cutting or judgmental, well, you know, readers will sort of think, well, that's the worldview of the book at the very least, if not the author themselves. When it's a first person narrative, it's just some other person who's saying this. It's not your fault that they're, they're saying these terrible things. And that's one of the advantages of, uh, of first person. One of the many. Yeah. Um, would you like to share what you wrote? <sighs> Reluctantly. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Um, it was difficult trying to be a single entity in such a large family. At what point does the family start and end and you become? Gareth zipped past me, not a care in the world, and an IQ to match. Same for his twin brother, Jonah. Did I mention we were in water? The local pool, a lake, the ocean, it doesn't really matter. I'm sure the nitrogenous waste within each water type is similar, no matter the size. The more water, the more potential of life. By the way, nitrogenous waste means piss for the uninformed. I come from a family of 57, which of course raises all sorts of questions. Are they all your siblings? Did your mother take multiple lovers from 12 to 80? Are you all adopted? My answer is generally get stuffed. And that's where I got to. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a really interesting character. Um, yeah, I mean, immediately it seemed to allow you to take on a worldview that was very different to your own. And that yeah. could be quite narrow. Um, you know, you were just the, the girl in the pool and the eye was just the sound of a distant telephone ringing somewhere in a far off city. It's, it's that sort of thing. You don't have to be as complete. Um, I liked that a yeah. lot. And I, I don't know about this line about Gareth because I think – was it without a care in the world and an IQ to match? Does that mean Gareth's just like a complete dunderhead? Well, you know, <sighs> um, we're trying to be like um, what unreliable narration, which is very unreliable. You have a very high IQ. <laughs> and I didn't get to the end, but it's like a tank of sea monkeys. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, fantastic. I love sea monkeys. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing. You can hide who you are in first person, in, in ways that you can't in third. You, you're sort of always yeah. inside. Um, I'll read you mine and you see if you can work out what, what's going on. Oh, okay. I was sitting at my desk staring at the clock as the sun set across the buildings outside my window. In the desk was a bottle I hadn't cracked yet, and God knows it was five o'clock somewhere. Lifting the lid, I snaked my hand in and fished it out. It was a fifth of milk, chocolate, warm enough to be halfway to curdled. I had in mind to wait for her to turn her back, but when I looked up, she was staring at me. She was a tall broad, taller than me, maybe an ex-model with a fetish for French poetry. The moment she walked through the door, I knew she was trouble. Not just a substitute, but the real thing. She stared at me down the length of a dainty nose, pursed those red baby doll lips. Her hair was ash blonde, a little grey and a little bottle, but I figured her for just south of thirty. Quite a looker, I thought. It was very Chandler of you. I was, I was trying for some Chandler, yeah. Okay. And I have to guess what you are. Yeah. I want to say a cat because you've got a lot of affinity for cats. <laughs> Not a cat. I was thinking of myself as, a, um, as an 11-year-old. And uh, when I was in school, we had a substitute teacher and she was very good looking. And slightly terrifying because she was actually paying attention and actually being a good teacher. Um, yeah. So, and we weren't used to that at all. It's what you might imagine Chandler was like when he was a child and the way he saw the world with his fifth of milk. Um, mm. Yeah. So, you mentioned like an advantage of first person is that you can enter in a different kind of world space 
than if you were in third person. Are there like any disadvantages or other advantages? Yeah. I mean, well, so basically first person and third person limited are probably the two most common points of view in modern fiction, particularly third person limited. Um, but they're also the two that are easily trans most easily transferred from one space to the other space. Um, the difference with first person is in a sense, it is not normal. If third person limited is essentially normal, invisible, uh, familiar, the minute you bring in first person, you bring in this concept of this other I who is not the world, not the shape of the story, but existing within it. Uh, and that other I might follow the conceit of being the reader themselves, or it might exist in stark contrast to the reader as a, as a counterpoint to the reader, as it did in um, Atwood's autobiography. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, the whole notion of point of view becomes, to some extent, problematized the minute you move into first person. So, like, for example, the Raymond Chandler stuff, that could be done in third person limited. Uh, the, the, the key thing about the Raymond Chandler novels and the character of Philip Marlowe is that the stories are really about Philip Marlowe. To a large extent, the mysteries are irrelevant. It's really about Marlowe and his internal space. So he spends a lot of time describing the furniture. But in a sense, the only furnishings that matter are um, Marlowe's various accents that he puts on different things, his, his, the notes and the little asides. It's, it's that. And so you're really traveling inside Marlowe. Whereas in, in Atwood's piece, she was putting space between the I and the you of the reader. Yeah. And that space was a space where there were unreliable uh, observations and descriptions. And that creates, I suppose, a sense of uh, mistrust and an awareness of the um, – of the created nat nature of the space. So these things are never arbitrary and picking one or the other is not an arbitrary decision. It really depends what you're trying for. Mm. So I remember I was trying to write like a really weird um, noir horror piece and it was in first person uh, and you recommended switching over to uh, third person limited to kind of get a more of a, that sense of horror involved. Well, yeah, because one of the implications of first person is that we're going to be with the narrator right up to the end of the book. So in terms of any sort of potential for peril uh, and a sudden shift to a new character, it's far less likely in first person. That much is being signaled the minute you put it in first person. You could play yeah. against that, of course. You could have a book that was built around multiple first-person perspectives, which may or may not be clear to the reader. Um, but God knows that could be quite a quite a messy undertaking. Yeah, that's interesting. It's all there as a possibility. Um, so that's first person kind of in a nutshell, I think. The second person is really interesting and barely ever done in writing. Um, when you want to think about second person, I always think of a hypnosis script. Yeah, you are getting yeah. sleepy. Uh, you imagine that you're, you know, on the train to Europa, and <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so it's being guided. It's being guided by someone who isn't you. That I think, in a nutshell, is is kind of what second person is. So you're writing. Uh, a you character, but who that you is may not be the reader. It may not be the writer or the narrative voice referring to itself. It could be lots of things. Uh, and so last week we, I read bread out for us. Uh, and I think it would be worth reading it again because it's such an amazing piece. This is from around the middle of murder in the dark, the collection. 
Um, are you are you feeling up to write, uh, reading this out? Yep. Awesome. Songs. I have it off of my screen, ready to go. Let's do this. Bread by Margaret Atwood. Imagine a piece of bread. You don't have to imagine it. It's right here in the kitchen on the breadboard in its plastic bag lying beside the bread knife. The bread knife is an old one you picked up at an auction. It has the word bread carved into the wooden handle. You open the bag, pull back the wrapper, cut yourself a slice. You put butter on it, then peanut butter, then honey, and you fold it over. Some of the honey runs out onto your fingers and you lick it off. It takes you about a minute to eat the bread. This bread happens to be brown, but there is also white bread in the refrigerator and a heel of rye you got last week, round as a full stomach then, now going mouldy. Occasionally, you make bread. You think of it as something relaxing to do with your hands. Imagine a famine. Now imagine a piece of bread. Both of these things are real, but you happen to be in the same room with only one of them. Put yourself into a different room. That's what the mind is for. You are now lying on a thin mattress in a hot room. The walls are made of dried earth and your sister, who is younger than you, is in the room with you. She is starving. Her belly is bloated. Flies land on her eyes. You brush them off with your hand. You have a cloth too, filthy but damp, and you press it to her lips and forehead. The piece of bread is the bread you've been saving, for days it seems. You are as hungry as she is, but not yet as weak. How long does this take? When will someone come with more bread? You think of going out to see if you might find something that could be eaten, but outside the streets are infested with scavengers and the stink of corpses is everywhere. Should you share the bread or give the whole piece to your sister? Should you eat the piece of bread yourself? After all, you have a better chance of living. You're stronger. How long does it take to decide? So what are your thoughts on that piece? Um, well, we did talk about this quite a bit in our last week's podcast, and every time I read it, especially those first two paragraphs, uh, I get chills. She does a fantastic job, like you said, of giving you autonomy and then taking it away again and again and again throughout this whole piece. Yeah, she does. And we we last week, we um, I, I, when I was reading it out, I, I interrupted myself. See, I can even interrupt myself. And... Uh, and, and pointed out that first couple of lines, but she does it again in the, in the last paragraph you read. And I thought I'd point this one out instead, just, just to be different. Okay. Imagine a famine. Now imagine a piece of bread. Both of these things are real, but you happen to be in the same room with only one of them. Is that right? I mean, I just read that. And if you're imagining that, uh, are you in the same room as a famine? I assume not. Are you in the same room as a piece of bread? I assume not. And it's really interesting. She's created these levels of reality. Yeah. There's your reality, which she completely ignores. There's the reality, the, the real space of this imag- of this imagining, which is where you're in a kitchen with a breadboard that you bought at an auction. I mean, this happened, obviously. Uh, and then there's this other space deeper in the imagination where there's a famine and a sick sister. But because the first imaginative space, the exterior imaginative space isn't real, paradoxically makes that, that deeper reality more real. She's breaking the lines between this and that. It's very clever. Yeah. It's very clever. Um, and I don't know that it would work in any other point of view. In fact, now it wouldn't work in any other point of view. It would have to be written in second point of person point of view for this to work. It's very powerful and it's, it's very clever. Yeah. And she does a similar thing in liking men, although it's similar, but it's different. Do, do you feel like reading that one to us as well? Liking men. It's time to like men again. Where shall we begin? I have a personal preference for the backs of necks because of the word nape, so lightly furred, which is different from the word scruff. But for most of us, especially the beginners, it's best to start with the feet and work up. 
To begin with the head and all it contains would be too suddenly painful. Then there's the navel, birth dimple, where we fell from the stem, something we have in common. You could look at it and say, he is also mortal, but it may be too close for comfort to those belts and zippers which cause you such distress and comfort is what you want. He's a carnival, you're a vegetarian. That's what you have to get over. The feet then. I give you the feet, pinkly toed and innocuous. Unfortunately, you think of socks lying on the floor waiting to be picked up and washed. Quickly add shoes. Better, the socks are now contained and presumably clean. You contemplate the shoes, shined, but not too much. You don't want this man to be either a messy slob or prissy, and you begin to relax. Shoes, kind and civilized, not black, but a decent shade of brown. No raucous two-tones, no elevator heels. The shoes dance with the feet in them, neatly, adroitly. You enjoy this. You think of Fred Astaire. You're beginning to like men. You think of kissing those feet, slowly, after a good scrubbing, of course. The feet expand their toes, squirm with pleasure. Do you like to give pleasure? You run your tongue along the sole and the feet moan. Cheat up, you start fooling around. Foot gear, you think. Golf shoes, grassy and fallily, white sneakers for playing tennis in, agile and sweet, quick as rabbits. Work boots, solid and trustworthy. A good man is hard to find, but they do exist. You know it now. Someone who can run a chainsaw without cutting off his leg. What a relief. Checks and plaids, laconic, a little Scottish. Rubber boots for wading out to the barn in the rain in order to save the baby calf. Power, quiet and sane. Knowing what to do, doing it well, sexy. But rubber boots aren't the only kind. You don't want to go on, but you can't stop yourself. Riding boots, you think, with a sinister crop, but that's not too bad. They are foreign and historical. Cowboy boots, two of them, planted apart, stomp, stomp, on Main Street just before the shot rings out. A spur in the groin. A man's got to do, but why this? Jack boots, so highly shined you can see your own face in the right one as the left one raises itself and the heel comes down on your nose. Now you see rows of them, marching, marching. Yours is a street level view because you are lying down. Power is the power to smash, to hold your legs to your arms. The fifth shoves a pointed instrument into you. A bayonet, the neck of a broken bottle, and it's not even wartime. This is a park with a children's playground, tiny red and yellow horses. It's daytime. Men and women stare at you out of their closed car windows. Later, the policeman will ask you what you did to provoke this. Boots were not such a bright idea after all. But just because all rapists are men, it doesn't follow that all men are rapists, you tell yourself. You try desperately to retain the image of the man you love and also like, but now it's a sand-coloured plain, no houses left standing anywhere, columns of smoke ascending, trenches filled with no quarter, heads with the faces rotting away, mothers, babies, young boys and girls, men as well, turning to skulls. Who did this? Who defines enemy? How can you like men? Still, you continue to believe it can be done, if not all men, at least some, at least two, at least one. It takes an act of faith. There is his foot sticking out from under the sheet, asleep, naked as the day he was born. The day he was born. Maybe that's what you have to go back to in order to trace him here, the journey he took step by step in order to begin again and again. That's a really powerful piece, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredibly powerful. Very unsettling. So I'm going to jump straight into this. It's time to like men again. Where shall we begin? So we have we. I have a personal preference for the backs of necks. So we are, there are two of us. Where shall we begin? Now I know it's the, perhaps the royal we. Nevertheless, this, this is not an accident. I have a personal preference for the backs of necks because of the word nape, dot, dot, dot. We move forward. He's a carnivore. You're a vegetarian. That's what you have to get over. So we have we, I, and you. 
And the move from first person, because it begins in first person, that shifts into second person. It's, it's tracing a shift in the relationship between the writer and the reader or the subject and object. And I think what's occurring is that the, the you is arguably still the narrator, but it's a narrator that is framing themselves at a distance. They are, they are yeah. pushing them instead of drawing you in like they do with bread. They drag the reader towards them. It's almost as if they're setting up this scenario for the reader and then backing away from it. And in a sense, uh, getting clear of it to, a, to an extent and leaving it for the, for the reader to deal with. Uh, that's, that's how I would imagine it in, in my head. And I think that's, uh, what's essentially occurring there in terms of the narrative point of view. Yeah. Um, until you pointed it out, I couldn't say that I noticed that there was that shift throughout that piece because it does such a good job of creating an image in a scene and then flipping it on its head. So I'm not sure if I was pushed away from what she was establishing. No, I don't think she's trying to push us away. I think she's backing away. Oh, so okay. she starts yeah, yeah, very yeah. personal and she moves out into sort of universal things where, where suddenly into wartime scenarios and, and all these sorts of things and lots of dead bodies. And so it, it moves from her personal space. I like Nape all the way to a sort of a universal you, which might mm. be uh, all women or all readers. Um, but it's tremendously clever and it's the, it's part of the clockwork of of this piece of writing it's not an accident it's not thoughtless it's not just an arbitrary choice she's using point of view in a very powerful and clever way a way that's yeah. done so well you can barely see it unless you're desperately trying to work out how it works which is you know what we're doing uh that's why we're here that's why we're here just to ruin it <laughs> ruin the magic for everyone um yeah so so you know that's that that is an incredible piece. And it's, and we have between bread and liking men, in a sense, two different functions for second person narratives. Uh, in one, yeah. she drew the reader in, and that's a very common, uh, use of second person to draw readers in to kind of say, this is what you think, uh, even if it isn't. Uh, but in liking men, I think she is more, it's a bit like I'm reminded of those things where, you know, step forward if you committed this crime and Margaret Atwood nods at you and goes, come on, let's just step forward together. And as you start to step forward, she doesn't move and you step forward on your own. It kind of feels like that. It's, uh, yeah. That's I, a good analogy. <laughs> I think that's what's happening here. She kind of sets the scene. It seems to be her thing. And then it becomes universal. And at a certain point, she doesn't seem to be there almost. She's, yeah. she's really at a distance, at a remove. Uh, and I think that's wonderfully clever. Yeah. So for our second and, and final uh, writing exercise for, for this time, I thought we'd work in second person. And I thought what would be really interesting is, if it's possible, to take the other character in the piece you were writing. So it might be it might be the uh, Sea Monkey Gareth in this one. I'm not sure for you, Shannon. But for me, it will be the teacher. Yeah. And I think it would be interesting to write a second person point of view narrative featuring the other character as the central protagonist. Now, here's what's interesting about it. So my teacher, uh, Blondie, I'm just going to call it Blondie, She, when she says you, she could be referring to herself. You know, you adjust your books as you turn around and start writing up notes on the board. She could also be talking about the boy sitting in the desk. She can actually move between those two things with the second person point of view narrative. She could choose one or the other or move between them potentially seamlessly. Uh, and I think, and, and then of course you also have the reader 
And the reader, if she's not aware of there being a reader, which is typical for most characters in most stories, uh, that reader might be more the figure of her better self, the self she wanted to be, or uh, the, the little girl she would have been if she'd been sitting in the class, you know, at that time. So you have, you yeah. have options, but what we're going to, what we're going to find with second person point of view is that it complicates character in lots of, lots of fascinating ways. So that's my idea. Um, now, if you, if you feel that the sea monkeys are too similar and there's not enough in there, um, I would suggest you include the character of the person who got those sea monkeys going. Oh, I was going to do that, Gareth. Oh, well, <laughs> um, we'll just we'll just edit that in post. <laughs> oh, that's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, six minutes, six minutes of power. Yep. I will start the timer in three, two, one, and go.
And that is time. Well, I suppose I should read first this time. Yes, you should. Mm, all right. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear what you think of this. You never expected to find yourself here, staring yourself right in the face, all lines and dimples on an otherwise blank page. There's a boy between you. He could be your father or the baby you never wanted, sucking on his bottle, never weaned and always overweaning in his false sense of manhood. You wonder if she has had this same moment, this meeting of the self in some other life. You wonder if she's already read of such things in the book no school would dare to add to their curriculum. Or maybe you think, what's she staring at? You didn't ask to be the center of attention. You were perfectly happy to fade into the background, into the grainy white nothingness, to sit and listen with eyes otherwise closed. I really like that. It reminds me, it's very Murakami. Yeah, um... I would- and I'm not saying that because I didn't like Murakami. I'm saying that because after doing some reading, um, the characters are like future and past and they're kind of separate but together. Like there's two uh, many alternate uh, ways that we can go. Yeah, I because what I had in mind was to write from the perspective of the teacher a, a, a young girl sitting behind the young boy who the teacher's fixating on and the reader who may be either or both of them. And as I read each sentence, I was trying to double check that it wasn't definitely one or the other in any sentence uh, so that I could yeah. maintain all three perspectives at once. It was really hard to grasp. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> But a very interesting exercise for me in trying to be comprehensible but oblique. Yeah. Yeah. What did you come up with? Are you happy with it? Actually, I'm really happy with it. Um, I like it much more than the other one, which I think makes a lot more sense on a surface level. Uh, But I think I like this idea when we use the second person point of view we can be talking to ourselves or to others or to others we're not even aware of there. Uh, and I like how you create multiple viewpoints by using second person, multiple potential viewpoints. Yeah. Um, I'll read mine and then I have a question, which I'll probably ask now before I forget. Because at the start you mentioned that you don't see a lot of pieces in second person. And my question will be, why is that? But I'm going to read mine. You can think about, think about it. You try counting them. How many times have you tried this before, but to no avail? It's hard. They don't stand still, constantly in motion, yet always in the same place, barricaded in by four glass walls. Occasionally one escapes, though escape is not the right word. When you enter the tank of water, one sea monkey will haplessly wiggle within the torrent of draining water to stay or to go, to be or not to be. But then the decision is taken away from you, the current too strong, and you slip off the edge and fall, and continue falling, falling, and you wonder, because you've been falling for so long, is there an end, and was there ever actually a beginning? Thinking maybe you were the sea monkey all along, and Scientology is real, and you are the monkey in a lizard man tank, as you go about your household chores, swim to keep healthy, go out to make a living, and to eat. The lovely decorated palm tree avenues, maybe they were purposely placed, not planted, just for aesthetics. And then I ended there. Oh, well, I love that. I adore that. That's fantastic. I could see what you were doing, like, because initially it's almost like a character talking to themselves. And so they're, they're investigating what they're, they're thinking about what they're thinking about. Um, but then there is this shift where it might not be that it's them thinking about what they're thinking about, but actually the sea monkey's point of view and that immediate blurring, uh, you did something that I, I wasn't expecting, which is shifting it across to a sort of a symbolic sea monkeyness, the sea monkeyness of people. 
Uh, yeah. And yeah, I was, I was delighted. I, I wonder what our listeners thought, but I think that's the best piece of the day. So bravo. That's f- oh, fantastic. I, yeah. I really loved that. Isn't second person fascinating? <laughs> I do enjoy writing in it. Yeah, yeah. But it is um, it, the reason why it, you don't see so much of it is it it does encourage, I think, a conscious a- awareness of the writer and the reader. I think it's it's very difficult to avoid that, and so invariably. Uh, most books want to have a reality effect and maintain a sense of their own reality. And this can potentially undermine that. So, yeah, you don't see many. Um, to be honest, I think Paul Oster's New York trilogy, I think one of the parts of that's in second person, but honestly, I can't think of a lot of long form second person pieces, not off the top of my head. But yeah, I, I think for emerging writers, uh, experimenting with second person is is really worth doing. And in the ways that first person and second person can be uh, melded together and interwoven, first person exercises are really good off the back of second person exercises, I would say. Yeah. Um, you'll learn a lot more about first person by springboarding out of a second person exercise. Um, so I think that's first and second person and they are, I guess the first half of our immediate investigations of narrative point of view. Um, and I think we are thinking next week we'd give third person a go. Yeah. So next week we are going to be doing another creative writing segment based again on Murder in the Dark. So we're going to be going through the three uh, third person um, points of view. So there'll be three writing exercises. And again, um, to the audience listening, uh, this was uh, dedicated to you guys because we love our generous listeners. We would love to hear what you guys produce and we're happy to read it out at the next one uh, podcast that we do and we just want to hear from you guys as well. I think that I think that was awesome. Um, I might do that again. I'm going to continue that piece because that was really fun. Mm. Like and subscribe if you're enjoying listening to us. We also have uh, lots of other social media platforms, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we haven't ventured into TikTok yet. To be honest, I'm a little bit scared, so maybe someone can convince me to do it and then I might try. Um, okay, until next week, everyone. Toodles. Goodbye to you. Goodbye.